Okay, you ready? Yeah, we are. Okay, uh, thank you. Please note uh, the collaborators here on this uh, uh, talk. Uh, well, I think that uh, everybody is uh, familiar with the uh, emergence of uh, the study of learning and especially deep learning, which I'll get into eventually in this talk. I want to give you uh, the mathematical or mathematician numerical analysis viewpoint of this uh, problem. So what is, uh, to me, the core problem of learning? We're given some data observations of some function f that's unknown to us. And f, let's think of it as defined on some domain omega contained in Rd. Here, d will typically be large in many applications. Uh, for example, in imaging applications, it's not unusual to have D bigger than, let's say, 10,000 or so. So that's going to be an issue as we move along. Uh, what our job is to create an approximation F hat to F away from the data. So we know what, for, for so, my uh, sorry, beginning Ron, here, I'm going to assume Ron, that we have, yeah. Can I interrupt you one second? Are you scrolling your slides right now? I'm using uh, a. Uh, so are you are you in the in, indicate where I am? No, I'm just on page two. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the full screen uh, your full screen uh, somehow does not allow to see the slides moving on. I think that's at the bottom. You mean or? You are, you're still, we are still uh, seeing the title page. We are seeing uh, the first page. Oh. So I don't know uh, whether you can try either to get out of the full screen. Okay. And then uh, simply go. Uh, so here you can see this screen, right? And then you can see the next. Now, now we can see the learning problem, yes. Now we can see the 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 second uh, slide. Of course, you probably see all this garbage on the left, which you don't need. But okay, thanks a lot. You'll put up with it. Yeah, you'll you'll put up with it during the talk. Okay, so I I I just said that uh, I want to take a mathematical view of this problem, and the problem to me is we have this unknown function f. Uh, and we have some data observations of F, and we would like to create an approximation, which I call F hat, that predicts F away from the data. And I forewarned you that in many applications, uh, the problem is that the domain, uh, which is a subset of our D, D is very large, okay? So if you take a mathematical view of this problem and somebody comes up to you and says, this is my problem, I have this unknown function and this data, uh, what a mathematician will do is try to uh, narrow down uh, the problem in some sense. The first question I'll ask is, well, how are you at the end of the day, if I create an F hat, how are you going to measure the success that I have in my algorithm. That is, what is the uh, measure of uh, fidelity or uh, how well have I done? And for a mathematician, what we typically do is we take some norm, which I'll take to be a, a norm in some Banach space X, and we would measure uh, the difference between F and F hat in this norm, and that would be the error that we have incurred with our algorithm. And of course, we want to make this as small as we possibly can. Now, in most applications, people take an L2 norm, it can be an ALP norm, or in applications for PDEs, for example, in PIN type methods, uh, this norm is a Sobolev norm. So that's the first question uh, a mathematician would say, okay, tell me how we're gonna measure success at the end of the day. 
The second question is, what can you tell me about the data? Uh, you know, what form does the data take? And I'm going to take the uh, uh, linear data. That is, I'm going to assume that the data that you have provided me are linear functionals applied to F. In, in the beginning, I want to uh, assume these linear functionals uh, come from the dual of uh, this Bonnach space X. Later, we're going to uh, weaken this assumption because we want to cover cases where the linear functionals are not defined on all of X. Okay, but for now, let's think of it, the, the, the information I have about F is this uh, form of data, linear functionals applied to F, which you may think of as inner products or point evaluations or whatever of F. Now, without any, if this was all the information I had, uh, I could say nothing because uh, I don't have enough information to uh, narrow down what F could be. Namely, uh, if this was all the information I had about F, this error here could be arbitrarily large because I haven't pinned down the function in any way outside of the data. So th this is an important ingredient here that we're going to need to assume more about F. And the type of assumptions that we uh, make about F are called model class assumptions. And in the weakest form, a model class assumption is simply to say that F comes from some set K, which is a compact subset of X. This will allow us to make quantitative statements about how well we can approximate F and see whether our algorithm is performing in some sense of, in a best uh, a form, which is what I'm uh, really interested in, optimal type of algorithms. Okay, any questions on this so far? That's probably pretty clear to everybody. It's all, all clear, right. thank so, you. Yeah, the next uh, question the mathematician asked is, well, is there an optimal solution to this problem? That is, is there an error uh, that we can uh, uh, possibly attain, but it can't be beaten, you know, a lower bound for how well we can do? And the answer is yes. And this is fairly uh, well known and people understand this. It, it, it actually relates in some sense to this null space property uh, discussed in the previous talk. So what what is this uh, optimal performance you can achieve. So you introduce a set K sub W. What is K sub W? It's all the functions in your model class K, that compact set, that satisfy the data. So the only information we have about our function F is that it's in KW. This is the totality of information we have about F. Namely, F could be any one of these functions in KW, right? And yet our F hat that we create must somehow simultaneously approximate all these possible Fs. So the best uh, solution to this problem is to take the smallest ball in X, right? In the topology of X that contains KW. This is called the Chebyshev ball. And the center of this ball would be the best we ch choice for F hat, all right? And the radius of this ball would be the optimal error that we could achieve in learning. Whether we can do this in, with a numerical algorithm will be an issue, but theoretically, this is a description of the best performance that uh, we can make. And if you do, uh, in some way, could find uh, this uh, center, then this would be uh, the optimal solution and the this radius of this ball is called the optimal recovery error. So this is a, also uh, referred to as an optimal recovery problem as well as a learning problem. And here's a little graphic to describe what I just said. The blue uh, figure here is the set K. Um, all I know about F is that it's any point here in this blue region. And so if I'm looking to approximate uh, 
F. It could be any point here, and I will never know which point it is. And so the best I can do is to take the center of this ball, and the radius is the uh, optimal error that I can achieve. All right, so that's, uh, you know, like the uh, air balloon story. It's very interesting. It's a theoretical description of the optimal uh, solution, but it's pretty useless from the point of view of numerical analysis because it's very difficult to find the center of this Chebyshev ball. On the other hand, if I could come up with a numerical algorithm that almost does the job, that is that it approximates F to an accuracy, some reasonable constant C times this optimal error, and then I would be happy, and we call this a uh, near optimal algorithm. And the typical Cs are two, three, four, they're not large. Uh, so that would be a near optimal solution to uh, this problem, and that's what I want to concentrate on. Can I find a near optimal solution to this learning problem? Okay, so, uh, and that will be the goal. Our goal as a numerical analyst will be to try to find a numerical algorithm that will generate an F hat that satisfies this near optimality. All right, now I want to describe to you uh, not really yet a numerical algorithm, but an optimization problem that if we solve this optimization problem, it would be a near optimal solution. So to describe this, let me first begin uh, with the case where the set K remembers any compact set in, in X. Let me assume that K is the unit ball of a subspace Y of X. This is the case, by the way, whenever K is uh, convex. You know, your baby functional analysis that you did years ago told you that if, whenever you have a convex set, it induces a subspace and a norm uh, uh, associated to that con uh, convex set. And, and so this is not uh, a terribly strong assumption. Uh, it, it just requires that in addition to K being compact, that it's convex. Okay, I want to just assume that for now. We'll drop that later, but let's assume that for the moment. So now if we introduce this penalized least squares problem, notice there's a parameter lambda here, and this is our uh, loss function, as one likes to say. We're going to be looking for functions G that minimize this loss. Namely, the first term tells you how well you're fitting the data. And the second term is somehow measuring how, uh, how close you are to being in the unit ball of this space Y. So these are, this is a common uh, penalized uh, least squared loss function. People like to say ticking off regularization or whatever, uh, but this is a, a well-studied well uh, optimization type problem. And now here is uh, the theorem. Suppose you find a finite dimensional space, sigma, or a finite, dim uh, finite dimensional nonlinear space, such as uh, neural network spaces or uh, free knot spline spaces or whatever. It could mean nonlinear, but finite a number of parameters in the nonlinear case. And suppose you can solve this minimization problem, and let's denote its solution by F lambda, sigma, then I claim that if your space sigma approximates K well enough to some accuracy epsilon, and epsilon is small enough, and if you choose lambda in this penalization small enough, then you have a near optimal recovery. And this is not terribly hard to prove, but it tells you uh, that that's a, a pathway that you can try to implement numerically towards getting a near optimal solution. So what are the takeaways from this theorem? The, the takeaways are that if you 
do a penalized uh, least squares, you will end up with a optimal solution. And these penalized least squares are of course very uh, common in uh, optimization. One thing to note is that in the penalized least squares that we would implement here, we need to drive epsilon very small. This may require us to take the dimension of sigma, which I call n, the dimension of sigma, very large. So uh, typically I do not have this restriction that n is less than the number of data points, but indeed n is much, much larger than m. And this corresponds to over-parameterization, which is now a common feature in modern uh, learning algorithms and perhaps explains a little bit why they use over-parameterization in their algorithms. Okay, so the, 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 the theorem guarantees optimality, but it, so far it does not tell me how I can numerically solve that optimization problem. It gives me a finite discrete optimization problem. Uh, says if I solve it, I, I'm near optimal in learning, but it does not tell me how to solve this optimization problem. Now, one thing you could object to so far in the statement of this uh, theorem is, well, oh, okay, it's great, but how small do I have to take lambda and epsilon? Can you quantify to me? Can you tell me in advance how small I will have to take lambda and epsilon? Or will I have to you know, do this by experimentation? The answer is yes, I can tell you in advance how small to take lambda and epsilon. And that's going to appear on the next slide, but it's not uh, particularly uh, transparent, uh, or let's say uh, it'll be some new features for you. Whoops. Okay, so here's uh, this slide is to tell you how you can tell uh, how small to pick lambda and epsilon. To do this, remember the set KW, this was all functions in K that satisfied the data. I wanna enlarge this set a little bit, pad it a little bit. I'll take the union, so delta will be a, a, a number that's small but bigger than zero. And I wanna take the union of all the KW prime that with W prime close to W. That, that means that this will be the collection of functions that almost satisfy the data. They, they don't quite have the fact uh, that the measurements are equal to W, but they're close to that. Now you can show, you can prove just from the compactness of K, here you do not need convexity or anything about K, just any compact set that the Chebyshev radius of this larger set here will tend to the Chebyshev radius of the set we were interested in. Remember, this is our optimal error. As delta tends to zero, this will converge to RKW. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is how fast it converges to RKW will depend very much on K and will depend on uh, the linear functional view used. So this is not a transparent uh, quantity, uh, RKW delta. So if I return to the theorem, if I want to put a quantitative version of the theorem, what I can say is that if you solve this optimization problem, that is you find that F hat that satisfied the optimization, then the error is less than or equal to three, the Chebyshev radius of this padded set with uh, an argument here, epsilon plus lambda. And remember I'm making epsilon and lambda small, so that's like making this delta small. And therefore I can guarantee that I'm close to RKW. And that's how I see that I have an optimal algorithm. Now to understand how in reality, how small epsilon and lambda need to be chosen, you need to study this function RKW delta. And uh, this can be done in any given uh, setting. You can spend some time. This is the analysis 
analysis part of the uh, whole routine is to study this uh, RKW uh, delta, to study how this behaves as delta tends to zero. How fast does it converge to RKW? I view this like a modulus of uh, smoothness for this uh, problem. Because, you know, like if you were just doing approximation of a function, how well you can approximate depends how smooth the function is. In our case, it'll depend on how well this RKW delta tends to RK of W. Okay. Now, uh, if you didn't like the uh, fact that I assumed that K is convex, let me just say that there is another version of the theorem that holds for any K. You change the loss function, you still have this least squares loss, but the penalty term is now the distance of g to k. This is not preferable because this is a lot harder to numerically implement this distance than it would be to compute the norm of g in this uh, space y that I had before. But nevertheless, there is a comparable uh, theorem and a comparable theory that if you solve this minimization problem, then for any compact set, start with any compact set, you don't need convexity, you will get a near optimal solution to your learning problem. Okay. Uh, can you see the, the top of this? I can't see the top of the screen. Something is blocking me. Yes, uh, we can see. Okay. So what what I want to do now is uh, turn to what's uh, what I formulated before here was that I, theorems where lambda i were any linear functionals, but they had to be in the dual of the space x where I was measuring performance or measuring error. Think about L2, for example. Suppose you wanted to measure error in L2 while well, requiring that the linear functionals were in the dual of L2 would preclude you from using point evaluation. And yet in learning, this is the most common setting where you assume that you have values of the function f, uh, that is your data that you're, you're given. So I wanna to turn to that case and say, okay, here's how you can massage what I've just said and handle this case as well. So let's assume that my data now is point evaluation and plus noise, but for the time being, I want to, you know, for the next uh, few minutes, assume that there is no noise and then we'll add noise after I complete the, the task with no noise. All right. So if I want this to make sense that this is uh, my, my problem, I must have a, you know, if you started with a general function in L2, this wouldn't make sense because the value of F at a point makes no sense, right? It's only almost everywhere at its Lebesgue points and the Lebesgue points of different Fs are different sets of points. So you need some vehicle for uh, uh, making this a well-formulated problem. And the vehicle I'm gonna use is I'm gonna assume that F comes from this compact set K and this set is a compact subset of C, continuous functions on omega, right? Not a compact subset of L2, but, or LP or whatever X was, but a compact subset of C. Now, point values of F make sense, okay? So that allows me to formulate this uh, problem. But Note, I'm going to still measure performance in L2 or LP. I'm not going to measure performance in C. I'm just going to assume my function that in my model class is nice enough that point uh, evaluation makes sense. Okay? So if you go to that setting, then you can prove an analogous theorem to what I uh, stated before. Namely, you introduce... Uh, so this is the second version of this theorem. Remember, I had two versions, one where I had a convex set K and the other was a general set K and both hold, but I'm just stating the one where you have a general set. You use the same loss that you had before. And again, you now your assumption is slightly different because you need that your 
linear space sigma or nonlinear space approximates k well now in the norm of c. So you need to know that it, you, the functions here in k are all in c, so this is not a terrible uh, assumption, but you need this, not in x where you're going to measure error, but in c. Then if you uh, uh, have this property, then finding a minimizer of this over sigma, right, over sigma, will provide you a near optimal solution to the learning problem. So this theorem says, yes, you can handle point evaluation as well. You don't need to assume the linear functionals were actually from the dual of X, thereby precluding uh, point evaluation. No, you can handle a point evaluation if you just assume that K allows you to evaluate uh, the fun function at, at points. Okay, now suppose the, 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 the uh, point values are noisy with some uh, noise. I'm going to discuss the deterministic uh, case where the noise corruption is a vector eta. Uh, and what I know about the noise is that it's uh, the less than or equal to delta. So this is the little L2 norm of the noise vector. So this is deterministic noise. If you want to handle stochastic noise, uh, that's another issue. And it's, uh, I know something about it, but I'm not going to talk about it. It's, it, it's far more complicated. Uh, and you have to go to the so-called minimax type theory. All right. So if you uh, assume noise and you have a, uh, uh, and you solve actually the same minimization problem, you get a recovery that is uh, near optimal in the sense of uh, uh, recovering any function f from your model class through measurements that have noise satisfying this inequality. The best you can do would be the Chebyshev radius of this RKY delta that you can prove as a theorem. This is the, the, the optimal recovery you can uh, do in the face of noise. And this algorithm here of minimizing uh, this uh, uh, discrete optimization problem would give you a near optimal solution. And here's sort of the quantitative uh, version of this from which you derive that it's near optimal. So I hope I'm not going too fast and losing anybody. If you want, I can take a, a minute break here and see if anybody has a question. Yes, let's uh, see whether there is any because question. I tend to go too fast, maybe. Any, maybe you're already no. tuned on and said, no, oh, this abstract nonsense. Ron. I'm not, <laughs> not interested in this. Okay. No questions? Uh, well, it's, it's more like um, maybe more philosophical. So, um, yeah, I mean, you express near optimal recovery in X, but I guess in practice, like especially with these modern high dimensional problem, it may be an issue how to measure actually distances. Uh, so, I, yes, I, know, well, I mean, you just yeah. assume that you that this information is given to you, but uh... I'm going to get to what people do in uh, modern uh, practice. But I, as a prelude to what I'm going to say there, let me just say there are very few theorems about performance for deep learning or what you would call modern learning. And you, you seem to be saying, well, maybe the problem is we don't know how to measure error. I would say no. In classification problems, you know, you typically measure the error by misclassification, right? Probability of misclassification. And in regression problems, you do typically measure the error in a least square sense. So, but, yeah, but okay. there is typically but, lacking theorems, right? Yeah, well, okay, it's it's not only about that, but also like, um, I mean, what is actually the set of functions you're interested in? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's an issue, but 
Uh, and I'm going to talk about that, Holger, in just a, a, a few moments. That's uh, true. That, you, you know, I, I said here at the beginning, you need a model class if you're going to have a quantitative theory. If you say, well, I don't know any model class, then I say, well, then you're not going to have, you're not going to have a theorem about performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm going to get to that. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So I plow ahead. Uh, so what I did not discuss here so far is how you can numerically solve the optimization problem I put down. In some cases, it's not too bad if you use a linear space. In many cases, you can end up with a convex optimization problem, and you can solve it using standard theory like Nesterov algorithm or, or something. Uh, a more common scenario is that you want to use a nonlinear space like neural networks, right? The outputs of neural networks use such a space sigma as the approximation tool, because you think, wow, these neural networks are really great. They do a great job of approximating. But then you usually arrive at a non-convex optimization problem. And now you're in deep, deeper trouble because there's not good theory for solving non-convex problems. People typically use things like uh, gradient descent algorithms. But as you, as I think you all know, that it's hard to find a good theorem about the convergence uh, of uh, these algorithms. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, we have used this uh, theory in uh, uh, solving PDEs where we have data and incomplete information about the solution to the PDE and it, using finite element methods as the sigma, and it works quite well but I'm not gonna get into that numerical aspect. Okay, you know, I wanted to say a few words about the data because <clears throat> this is a, an important problem, especially if you wanna develop a robust theory. Namely, I said, well, my data is that I have linear functionals applied to F. I have M, M uh, data values, right? And the question is, well, what, you know, what are those linear functionals? What are the data sites? And there are typically <coughs> four settings that I wanna mention because I think we need some people, some smart people like we have in the audience uh, looking at uh, this, this problem. So uh, the first setting you can say is, well, I, I don't know anything. I, somebody just came and gave me these M data points taken taken at these sites. Well, then you're you know you're going to have to do a very ad hoc analysis uh, about the you know performance for those particular sites. It will all depend on those particular sites. For example, if the data were all crunched into some part of the domain. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do a good job if the data were all concentrated in some small ball, let's say, in the domain, then the R of KW is going to be very big, right? You're not going to be able to recover F uh, away from those data points. So, uh, you know, your, the, the R K of W will, will depend very much on where the uh, data sites have been chosen. Second setting though, one that we like to do in analysis and, and Holger will be happy with this, is we like uh, uh, to say, well, suppose we can choose the best M functionals from X at which to measure for K, right? We're given this compact set K and now we wanna take the M best functionals. This is the same as Gelfon width. And my point here is that one should, if you, if you have in mind some model class K that you think is reasonable for, for your problem, then an issue is to study the Galfon width of K. Now you may say, well, why do I need to study it if I don't have these optimal functionals? Well, the reason is that this will tell you the best you're ever gonna do no matter who, what functionals you have. So whatever data you're given, you're not gonna do better than the DMK. 
So it sort of tells you a lower bound for how well you can do in performance. Now, another setting that people like to, to look at is, well, that we have point evaluation functionals. So we're not in the setting where we have arbitrary linear functionals. We say we, don't, we, we have point evaluation. Then the optimal uh, recovery is the sampling number of K, right? SM of K. And this is studied in a lot of uh, contexts, but I want to advertise that you need to study this for model classes that are relevant in high dimensions. And model classes that people are using in deep learning, you need to do this for, and this is by and large not studied and not known. Uh, and then the fourth setting is that one that people in machine learning frequently use is they assume that the data sites are chosen at random. For example, if you had point evaluation that you took M random points from the domain subject to some probability measure mu, and that's the, uh, the data you have about F, we call this the average sampling uh, numbers for K. And again, you should, this is my main point here of this slide or two, is that you should, we should concentrate some of our energy on understanding, understanding the width and sampling numbers for model classes that may be relevant on high dimensional problems. And model classes that are used, currently used, uh, in uh, learning, machine learning, deep learning, such as the Baron classes or convex halls of dictionaries and the like, low dimensional manifolds. Okay, it's just an advertisement that we need some energy in that direction. Okay, now let me talk about deep learning because uh, I think most people associate uh, solving the learning problem with deep learning. So what does deep learning do? Let me first tell you what deep learning means to me and what people do in deep learning. And then we'll try to make a comparison between what they do, what I talked about, what the gap is, what, what should we do to fill that gap. So in deep learning, one typically starts out by saying, well, I'm gonna use over-parameterized neural networks to build my numerical algorithm for learning. That will be this, the sigma right, as I used in my, my case. Why neural networks, I guess, because they think that neural networks are very good at approximating high dimensional uh, functions uh, as compared to the more traditional methods like uh, splines or uh, uh, finite element methods or wavelet methods and the like. Okay, so that's the first thing. They use over-parameterized neural networks with a certain architecture that means uh, uh, the certain sigmoidal function typically in the neural network. And then they solve a, a, just the least squares problem without a penalty. Ah, this, this already makes me nervous that they're solving least squares without a penalty. Why? Because there are infinitely many solutions to this problem, right? If, if I have an over-parameterized sigma and I try to minimize this over sigma, right? There will be infinitely many solutions to this problem. Well, now what are you gonna do? <laughs> what, what solution are you gonna pick out of there and how are you gonna do it? Well, then they impose a very specific numerical algorithm to apply to this loss, namely they use gradient descent based on some parameterization of sigma. So now they, they say, well, you know, this is how I'm gonna pick out the G, right, from sigma that satisfies this problem because there are gonna be infinitely many Gs that will exactly fit the data. So I have to tell you which one I'm gonna pick out. And I'm going to pick it out by using gradient descent. But now this becomes a little fuzzy because when you use gradient descent, you have to, it all depends on, maybe I have this on the next slide. Yeah. So when you, when you use gradient descent, uh, it's, it's rather 
subtle because it depends on the following. First, it depends on the initial guess, all right? Secondly, it depends on the, the learning rate, the step size you, you implement in gradient descent. Sometimes this is vaguely said. Uh, how It also depends on the parameterization of, for the neural nets. They have uh, a standard parameterization that they use, but there are other parameterizations. In fact, the parameterization that they typically use in, in deep learning is uh, redundant parameterization, and there are more parameters than you needed to describe the elements in the neural network. And another issue is that uh, sometimes they employ, you know, you talk to, I, I talk to these people and I say, well, I don't understand what you're doing and how you're ever going to get a guarantee and why it performs well, because when I try to program this, and it's not me, but students programming it, we don't get good results. And they say, yeah, well, you don't get good results because you didn't do your initial guess correctly or you didn't do your step size correctly. You didn't take it small enough for this or that reason. So it becomes more of an art than it becomes a science where they can prescribe to you, do this, do that, and you're guaranteed uh, success. And another thing that they, they use is that if they've chosen an architecture and a neural net and it doesn't perform well, then, they, they, then somehow somebody signals that to them, tells them, oh, you haven't done well. So then they go back and they change the architecture and they maybe change the learning rate or whatever. Well, this mathematically is illegal, right? <laughs> it's Ill illegal for the statement of the problem. Because, you know, it's saying that you have a, an oracle here that you can query and say, hey, how well am I doing? You know, am I getting close or am not, I, I, I not getting close? So I, I, I sort of object to this a little bit. Okay, so one of the, per you know, what's the problem with uh, uh, deep learning is I, I see it, there's a, this lack of theory uh, supporting the convergence of gradient descent for non-convex problems. I, I already mentioned that this test error is used illegally. Uh, another problem from a numerical analyst point of view is uh, there is no bound on your computational effort. Namely, nor normally when we're solving a numerical problem, we know that the more computation we spend, the longer we work on the problem on the computer, the better we're going to do. Let's say you're solving a PDE numerically. We measure how good an algorithm is in terms of how many computations did you need to achieve a certain error. If here you say, well, all this is done offline and I don't care how long it took me to learn. I may have taken five weeks to learn the architecture and, and the parameters in the neural network, well, that's, that's a little bothersome to a numerical analyst. He, he would like you to quantify also how much time was spent or how much computation was spent offline to learn your F hat, okay? And then of course, there's this pr problem of lack of reproducibility. How many of these, uh, algorithms, can you actually write down the rules that uh, this is what I'm going to do, and then a, a, another researcher somewhere else can take these rules and apply it and get the same results that you had. All right. So now I, I think it would be interesting. So, so one of the, the things that concerns me, as I've already mentioned, is the fact that in deep learning, you have no model class assumption. Holger began talking about that. I think that was, was his point. You don't have a model class assumption. And I started out by saying, well, if you don't have a model class assumption, you're not going to have a theory. Well, what, what is the viewpoint they take? By the way, maybe I skipped over that. The, the, the viewpoint that people in deep learning take here is that Hey, uh, okay, you, you and your model class assumptions, I don't care about your model class assumptions. I, I don't know what the model class is, but, but I have an algorithm. I have this deep learning algorithm, neural nets, 
stochastic uh, gradient descent, blah, blah, blah. And I know it performs well. That's what they claim. Although they don't have a, a quantifiable theorem. Why, you know, because they don't have a uniquely defined uh, 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 problem. So in, in, in place of that, they try to say, well, what function did I learn? And then you see this theory for neural tangent kernels and the like, which tries to explain what is, if, if the algorithm is converging, what does it converge to? What function is learned? What I don't like about this neural tangent kernel stuff, it is sort of saying it doesn't matter what F you began, began with, what, what the model class was. I always end up with the same, uh, <clears throat> in essence, the same model class, this neural tangent kernel. Uh, thing. So it doesn't reflect any intrinsic knowledge you would have about the, uh, the function you're trying to learn. Oh, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of feedback <laughs> on these statements. Sorry about that. But uh, okay, so how do I see some sort of piece that we can uh, bring to this that between me, who's uh, tough by saying you need this model class assumption, and the learning community, the deep learning community, which doesn't impose it and begins some other type of analysis. Well, one way you could look at it, in my opinion, is that you could say, well, there, there is a model class. Maybe this is Holger's view. There is a model class, but I don't know what it is. I mean, my data came from some function and uh, there is something there. There is some information about F, but. I mean, that must be because I have a specific application in mind, but maybe I haven't figured out what the model class should be. When we solve PDEs, these model classes are given by regularity theorems for the PDE that tell us the properties that the solution to the PDE has, and that gives us the model class we, we need to impose. So we're in safer territory. When you're do, doing imaging applications, uh, one is not so certain about what the model class should be. One talks about the manifold of real world images and one tries to view these as low dimensional manifolds, et cetera. But uh, I don't think there's any well uh, accepted uh, model class in, in, in those settings. But what I wanna say is uh, there is something uh, called universality in learning. I don't know if most people are familiar with it. So in, in my uh, setting, I start with a model class, I develop an algorithm that solves the learning problem for that model class. But somebody can say, well, I, I, let's say my model class was a smoothness class, like a, a Sobolev space, that the function is in some Sobolev space. You could take the viewpoint, well, you know, I know the functions in some Sobolev space, but I don't know which one. I don't know the order of smoothness. Can you solve the problem without that information? And the answer is yes. You can solve the problem without knowing the smoothness order. So you don't precisely know K. Okay. Now the solution is not what I described. You have to do more work, but such an algorithm is called universal because it works for a variety of model classes. And it figures out for you the model class. It figures out from the data what the model class should have been. And that's maybe where we are in, in uh, learning and, and how deep learning can intersect with what I'm doing. And so one way to formulate this is to say, well, let's, since we're using neural networks, we must think that our function can be well approximated by, by neural networks. So let's introduce these uh, approximation classes functions that are approximated with a certain rate by neural networks. And let's think of that as our model class. Now we don't know alpha, but we know that F is in one of these A alphas and hopefully it's for a big, big value of alpha, but we don't know. Can you develop a learning algorithm that is nearly optimal for all these classes? And that may be possible I think that would be tough sledding to do that, but it may be possible. Okay, so let me close here. So uh, what did I do in this uh, talk? 
uh, first I said you needed a model class in order to have a quantitative theory. I told you that given that you have a model class, I can give you an optimization problem that if you solve it, you will have a near best algorithm. I discussed a little bit when and how you can solve numerically this optimization problem, okay? The challenges are what is left uh, open, I think, to, even in the case where I have a model class, uh, are the following. When I have this discrete optimization problem, in some cases I can, as I mentioned, I can allude to known algorithms and prove that they converge and they, they actually solve my optimization problem, but frequently not because I have a non-convex problem and I just don't have any theoretical or uh, quantified numerical algorithm with, with performance that guarantee I'm solving this problem. So that's one challenge. Another challenge, which I think relates to what uh, Holger was saying, is that in high dimensions, we really don't know what the model class should be. So we, you know, we postulate things like uh, low dimensional manifolds or sparsity in some dictionary or whatever, but we need to work harder at understanding what are reasonable model classes in high dimensions. And finally, I reiterate my uh, one slide where I said, you know, we, we need to uh, understand sampling rates and uh, average sampling rates and Galfond widths for these model classes. I think one of the things uh, in even in deep learning, how do you know that you have enough data to solve your problem? I mean, uh, what is enough data? Because you're in a high dimensional problem, if you think of D as 10,000, you know that you have 10,000 quadrants. If you had just one point in every quadrant, you would have to have two to the 10,000 points. That's uh, re unreasonable, right? So, how would you, so wh what is it that tells you that you have enough data to solve the problem? Well, it must be that. The function came from some model class that's highly restricted. It's not anywhere near general function in, uh, uh, of uh, D variables. It's very narrowly uh, quantified in some way, but you just don't know what the model class is. So, so I think you know the idea should be that we should propose model classes. We should try to determine the sampling rates at least to see that for these model classes, it's conceivable to solve a learning problem with not in an unusually large set of data necessary to resolve it. Okay, I think I'll close there and uh, you can shout out at me if you have some questions or objections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Let's thank Ron.